On behalf of all of us at Grife, welcome to the Discover Grife webinar series. My name is Cheryl Cottle, and I am responsible for marketing and communications for our rigid industrial packaging division. And I'll be your moderator for today's event. We wanna thank you for making this Discover Grife series such a popular um, experience over this year. It's been a challenging year for everyone and we are grateful for the opportunity we've had to connect with you using this platform. And this is our last webinar for 2020. And we're pleased with the response and the attendance that we have for today. In the, while we're waiting for others to join, I'm just gonna launch a quick poll here to try and get an idea of what you would like to see for next year as we're planning our 2021 calendar. And you're up, you can pick more than one option here, but the 30 minute tech talks are something about short technical events that are around down gauging, lacquered or lined drums, some sustainable solutions. Um, consultative topics would be similar to what we're doing today, maybe on packaging advice, um, safety, sustainability, cost reduction opportunities. Uh, we've also investigated more product focused. If you wanna get more involved, we've done a lot on all of our substrates this year, but we can definitely go deeper into those. And then another option we've considered is a little mini packaging expo. We're not able to see you face-to-face -face at trade fairs or trade shows um, during this year. So we thought maybe it would be unique to offer something like that where you could interact with multiple people within Grife. So we're considering a little mini, mini expo. And then of course, virtual production tours. I think that's been a very popular request. Feel free to email me any topics you would like to see, put them in the chat function. Um, we'll, we'll follow up on those, but I'm, I'm really pleased to see um, the topics that you guys are all selecting. It's gonna make my life challenging next year to get them all on the calendar and get them booked. So thank you very much for taking the time to vote on what you would like to see next year. Okay, so let's get started with today's event. I wanna briefly introduce you to our four presenters. First, we have Kevin Kling. He has been a staple at a lot of our webinars during this year. He was uh, previously in a role of product management for our plastics and IBCs in, in the Americas, and has recently taken a new role as our director of sales and marketing for the Midwest region of the United States. But he's been with Greif for 17 years, has served in various functions that include logistics, supply chain, procurement, and product development. Joining Kevin today, we have John Fort. He's responsible for packaging advice, IBC UN compliance, and technical support activities. He joined Greif in 2017, and he has a BS in chemistry. Phil Zamprin has been with Greif for 31 years, currently is working as our Director of Quality Assurance and Regulatory Affairs. The department's responsible for the development implementation and monitoring of our quality and food safety compliance programs across the Americas. His team manages 10 satellite IBC and steel test facilities and one central test facility for plastics and fiber. And every year we have approximately 700 or more UN designed packaging products that are or projects that are tested as part of our US testing program. And then finally, we have Eddie Shore, who began his career with drums almost 37 years ago at a small steel drum reconditioning plant in Belgium. He currently works in our quality department in Belgium and is a product project manager for transport and regulations. He's actively involved with several European bodies working on legislative topics with regards to transport of dangerous goods, environmental regulations, and plant licenses. So we will be recording today's event to share for those, with those who could not attend. And we'll send that out later today via email. Your account managers will also have the PowerPoint presentations to share with you if you're interested in those as well. We are using Zoom today. So you'll find a chat button at the bottom of your screen where you can feel free to submit your questions throughout the event. And we'll take time at the end to go through and answer those questions. Our agenda for today will be as follows. We'll review the UN recommendations and some local regulations. We'll identify the UN markings on drums and the markings on IBCs. And then we'll close with a Q&A or question and answer session. So Eddie, I'll let you get us started. Okay, thank you, Cheryl, for your nice introduction. 
So uh, I'm living in Belgium, uh, not that far away from uh, Brussels. And uh, yeah, the weather conditions are yeah, a bit gray, some five degrees C, some 40 uh, Fahrenheit. Yeah, we are getting into the cold and dog days, let me call it like that. Now, okay, let's uh, turn, uh, t t tell a few things about yeah, legislation because we all hear a lot about yeah, transport and dangerous goods legislation and let's have a look at it. So I would like to take you on board, having a look on the structures behind that uh, legislation, because basically spoken, yeah, the Orange Book, it's all known. People talk about the Orange Book, and then in the States, you have the Red Book. So first of all, uh, the recommendations for the transport of dangerous goods. Uh, by all model, uh, the transport except a bulk carrier, yeah? that Orange Book. And that Orange Book, I'm coming back on it later on. In Europe, we have the ADR, ADR as such. I hear someone coming in. Sorry, Eddie, I don't know where that's coming from. Um, I'll try and mute it if you want to just keep going. Okay. So uh, Europe, uh, ADR, and in the US, it's uh, subject to the regulations of the pipeline and hazardous material administration. Other countries have their own laws and governing bodies who are most uh, aligned with the UN recommendations. DOT stands in the US for uh, transport of uh, uh, Department of Transport uh, on the UN model regulations for transport of dangerous goods. Next slide, please. So and now we are putting on screen a very complex structure as such. And as we all can see, okay, this is what's happening in the UN structure as such. Now we have in uh, uh, the right corner up there, 27 or 28 now I have been told, the expert countries and they have a vote as such. So this means that during the discussions uh, in Geneva, all the different topics are handled and then the chairman can ask the 27, 28 countries to give a vote. You have also observers countries and they can also give in their impact and they again also send out or send in uh, proposals but basically spoken yeah it's clearly they don't have a vote and then on the other hand you have also at the floor the ngos for industry uh, packaging also uh, industry coming from uh, batteries for example nowadays lithium batteries are very hot topic in uh, the, uh, the un meetings as such and graph as such is uh, represented uh, in that forum by, for example, ICDM, that's the organization, uh, World Organization on Steel Packaging, Steel Drums, ICCR, the reconditioners worldwide, and ICBP, uh, the plastic drum manufacturing uh, companies as such. All the structure, and I don't want to go too deep in detail, is ending up in, for Europe, for example, when we look to the right-hand side, downside, inland transport, and then you have uh, road, rail, and inland waterways, ADR, RID, and ADN as such. Next slide, please. So a few more, uh, a few more info on ADR as such. ADR has been written in 1957 as the Euro European Agreement Concerning the International Carriage of Dangerous Goods by Road. Now, just for your information, uh, the last year meeting of this uh, forum has decided to take away the term Europe, as you can see on the map here on this screen, that it's not only Europe. It started in Europe, but more and more countries in our hemisphere in uh, Europe are taking over the legislation. And as such, that's the reason why they decided to uh, take out Europe out of that title. Basically spoken, uh, all the meetings are running in the biennium system and they have each time for meeting. And at the last meeting, they are bringing everything together and then uh, this is brought into legislation. Having a look on how this is done, okay, in Europe, ADR as we just mentioned. So we have something what is called working party 15. So in that VP15 structure, there we have, first of all, uh, an ADR, RID, ADN joint meeting, and they have their own structure and they come up with their own proposals. Besides that, we have also what's called the harmonization working group, and they are bringing or taking over uh, the information coming from the UN uh, recommendations, and they bring it all together 
and that is coming then in ADR. UN Model Regulations 21, that was the previous one, is ending up in ADR legislation 2021, as from the 1st of January. It's a coincidence that it's 21 ending up in 21. Because, okay, looking what is happening now, so 2019, 2020, so we are on the last meeting now today um, in this biennium, and that will become legislation in 2023. Just for your information, uh, just this week, uh, uh, the UN uh, recommendation meeting started in Geneva normally, but uh, due to the Corona or the COVID-19 problems, uh, the last meeting, the summertime meeting has been fully canceled. And now this has been fully taken over by Zoom meetings or inter-profile meetings. Uh, and they are officially voting as they are doing, basically spoken in the full forum in the meeting as such. So this ends my presentation. I'm back to you, sir. Thanks, Eddie. So now let's turn to the UN marking on drums and we'll set some goals today, including decoding the UN mark. And so I'm gonna start off with some basics. Then we'll get into the packaging code followed by performance and then we'll try and put it all together. So first let's talk about hazardous materials. What is a hazardous material? Well. We define it as anything, as a material capable of posing a high risk to health when transported. And we categorize them in classes one through nine. And here at Greif, we focus on packaging everything except class two, which are flammable gases. Just a bit about Greif for anyone that's not aware. Uh, Greif Brothers was founded in 1877 in the United States. We've evolved over the years, became Greif Bros, and today we are Greif Packaging. Uh, in the late 90s, through a couple of key acquisitions, including Van Leer containers, we became a global company. And today we manufacture various packaging, including steel, fiber, plastic drums, IBCs, uh, liner board and medium, which go into corrugated as well as other corrugated products, and flexible bags. Today we're going to focus on steel, fiber, and plastic drums, as well as IBCs. All right, let, let's get to the basics. The first part of the UN mark is the UN symbol itself, right? This is where when you're looking at a package, you, you can determine if it is, uh, is capable of handling pack, uh, hazardous materials. The mark itself should be at least 12 millimeters tall uh, and with, uh, it should be made legible and of contrasting colors, albeit uh, this portion is a little subjective to, to what exactly contrast is as you'll often find marks um, embossed. And then really this mark is where you look in the drum to see exactly how it was tested. And so with that, I'm gonna flip it over to Phil and he'll take you through a little bit more of the details. Thank you, Kevin, and good morning to all. Uh, before we, and, and what Kevin just described there is probably the only standard part or global part of the marking, it, it, regardless of, of which UN package you're dealing with, that UN symbol is on all of them um, and it's the same. Um, before we get started into the marking and the meanings, uh, the meaning of all those little uh, symbols, numbers, and letters that make up the UN code or the UN certification mark, I just want to talk a little bit about the basis for the marking. The basis of the marking is all is all based around POP or performance-oriented packaging, and what that means is that the is that the marking is based upon the performance of the packaging itself, and the performance requirements are established by the hazardous risks associated with the lading. Uh, or the intended lading for that particular package. The higher the risk of the lading, the higher the marking or, uh, and the tougher it would be to pass a test. The tougher it is to pass a test, the more robust materials and specifications you need to actually build that, back, that packaging. The second thing I wanna cover before we, we get into the actual uh, details of the marking is that for each chemical that's produced, there is a uh, UN transportation number or hazardous, hazardous classification number. Those transportation numbers are all referenced in particular tables that are held locally by your local regulators. And they give you sort of the, the roadmap on how to properly select your package. The UN number uh, may have different packaging and special requirements uh, for, for different modes of transportation. For example, uh, modes of transportation established by IATA or IMDG that give more, more, uh, more specialized requirements as the quantities and types of packaging that you can use for those individual uh, uh, chemicals. Beyond that, uh, 
establishing the the actual product group and the uh, the, the type of package you can use, uh, it's it's more or less based upon uh, the following three criteria for selecting your package. One is obviously your shipper and end user packaging needs, uh, the chemical compatibility of your product with the actual materials used in the construction of the drum, and the com and the confines that are established by those various transportation associations like IATA or IMDG. So now that we have a little better understanding of what POP means and, and uh, how it relates to the, uh, the UN packaging code uh, and the escalation of riskier products require higher rated packaging, for example, packaging group one through three, uh, packaging group one materials generally present the greatest amount of hazard through to packaging through three, which is a minor hazard. And it corresponds to the marking uh, through the following uh, through the following X, Y, and Z rating. X rated products generally can hold all three packaging groups. Y rated uh, markings or packaging can hold packaging groups two and three, and Z rated packaging can hold can hold only packaging th group three. The first part of the UN marking. Uh, and it's really made up or comprised of the first two to five characters. Uh, and it comes right after the UN symbol. It generally describes three main things. One is the packaging type, whether it's a single packaging, whether it's a box, whether it's a bag, whether it's a jerry can, uh, the materials of construction. And you'll see that the materials of construction are basically leading inside out what touches the product first out to the out to the actual outer part of the container if there's more than more than one composition of a, of a particular package and the packaging configuration when applicable for a steel drum uh, which can which can hold both solids and liquids they generally start with one for a single use pack or a single packaging meaning it's it's a it's a uh, non-bulk single packaging a designates the material type which is for steel and one at the end designates the packaging configuration, one or two, open head or tight head. You'll also notice that there are what we call composite packages and composite packages are made up of two primary materials and composite packages, as far as packaging types, start with the letter or start with the number six. And then you'll notice it goes into an H, which is for plastics, A is for steel and one is for tight head. For steel drums, uh, you'll notice that uh, they, they not only contain a, a marking on the sidewall, but they also contain a marking on the on the bottom or what's called the bottom embossments. Any container over 100 liters must be marked with with a permanent embossing on the bottom that designates uh, the uh, the UN which uh, the UN code up to the actual certifying body itself or the, certif the, the, the third party laboratory cert certificate that, that in some cases is applied to that drum. So it generally is a duplicate of that marking. For drums that are intended for reconditioning, you'll, no uh, uh, you'll notice that uh, the, the packaging is marked with the thicknesses of the steel. The standard configuration for how we describe the thickness is generally top, body, bottom. The thickness of the top of the container, the thickness of the body of the container, and the thickness of the bottom of the container. And it's in millimeters. Uh, it is permissible by UN re uh, regulations that uh, if the entire package is made from one thickness, that you only need to mark the single thickness of the container. I'll turn it back over to Kevin for plastics. Thanks, Phil. Now, like steel, plastic drums are also constructed and tested to hold uh, both solids and liquids. And following the, the same uh, configuration, you've got a, a one, uh, and then we got the H as, as opposed to the A, which is going to uh, be there for the plastic. And then, you know, a one H1 would be a tight head, and then a one H2, again, the difference between the, the one and the two at the end uh, for tight head versus open head. Similar packaging, if you're talking jerry cans, uh, following the same nomenclature, be a three would designate for jerry can, then a three H1 uh, for essentially a, a non removable or tight head, and a three H2, the two would, would designate the removable. Um, 
moving on to fiber. Uh, fiber is only constructed to hold solid goods. So it makes the, the packaging group pretty straightforward. We use a 1G and the G just simply designates that it's primarily made of paper. The next sequence of the marking uh, describes the requirements for the testing. Um, and there are two, there, there are two types of uh, test, test uh, 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 regimens that you typically have. One is for a solid rating and one is for a liquid rating. Generally, these tests sort of represent the hazards that may be present through the transportation mode. The drop test, which is meant to simulate a free fall uh, or an impact on the, on the drum itself. The compression test is meant to simulate a storage or st the storage and stacking conditions or how much weight can be loaded on top of the drum. The hydrostatic test is meant to simulate a buildup of pressure within the container that may be produced as your, as your products or, or as, as the temperatures elevate uh, and your product becomes more vaporous and, and, and turns into vapor. Uh, the leak proofness test is used to establish the integrity of the container uh, to contain the liquids. So if it's a liquid carrying container, it must, be, it must be leak tested. It's important to note that all liquid rated drums are 100% leak proof tested prior to, prior, uh, during manufacturing. The, you'll know, uh, when testing, uh, uh, and we'll go through the, the individual test requirements and not all of them, there are, there are requirements uh, uh, that we record or understand how we actually prepared the package for testing. It's important to note that because the, uh, those must be communicated to the customer as a requirement of the regulations. So if we're testing and closing, that, closing a drum a particular way during a test, that has to be mimicked when you're actually preparing it for shipment. So those instructions that, 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 that you receive as closure notifications are basically what we use for testing as well. You'll note that some, some retesting is done uh, or, or retesting of packaging is done differently globally. And that really uh, is based upon the local regulations that govern, that, uh, that govern the manufacturing of, of, of uh, UN mark packaging. Uh, in the US, it's annual. In other countries, it may be three years or five years. I believe France is five years. Some, uh, some countries do not require retesting and they rely more on quality assurance programs to protect or to ensure that the, uh, that the uh, packaging design doesn't, uh, doesn't all, uh, stray from the, the original tested design. Uh, and that's where we get into what, what's called quality control versus quality assurance. Uh, and the way different governments sort of view those. The first test I want to describe here is, uh, is, is the drop test. Each, each drum, regardless of whether it's, it's solid, uh, sol intended for solids or intended for liquids, must go through a drop test. As, and as you can see here, the drop test or the requirements for the drop test varies greatly uh, based upon the packaging group of the materials or the intended uh, uh, hazard that, that's, that's meant to go into that package. Um, and the general degree or the, the safety factor that they, that they put in is somewhat 50%. So if you had a packaging group one material and uh, it needed to be, it needed uh, packaging group one material, we would need to drop that drum from a 1.2 meter uh, uh, elevation. If we move to a packaging group one material, that safety factor would increase by 50% and we would go up to 1.8 meters. Uh, there's another thing to, to, to note when, when we're talking about liquid, liquid rated materials, because we're, we're, we are testing uh, drums with a medium of water, uh, we're using that as the basis for these, for these calculations when we determine drop test uh, heights. Uh, when we're dealing with packages that contain a higher density, and you'll notice that uh, in the marking below, you have a 1.4 density. Uh, that means that, that that product that it's intended to hold actually weighs more than water. For that, we actually increase or multiply that factor by those by the by the factors you see over there on the right hand side. It's the the density of the material multiplied by that safety factor of 50%. 
I'm going to show you a short video here of what a drop test looks like, and I'll just describe some of the features of the drops uh, of the drop test as we go through the video. You'll see here that the that the lifting device or mechanism can be either a strap or some uh, some use a, a mechanism to hold onto that top chime. And what they're really trying to do is angle that drum on an impact of, of 45 degrees on a particular area of that drum. The, the two areas that we're testing primarily are, the, are the, the largest fitting and the bottom seam and that intersection in the bottom seam and the, uh, and the bottom chime. You'll notice on the right hand side there is a there is a marking of the elevation. He's actually using a laser to, to to determine how high that drum is. Right now, after the drop, he drilled a hole in the drum, and that hole was to alleviate the the vacuum that's created inside of that drum because the, when the drum impacts uh, in that degree, it actually you're reducing the volume of that drum and it's trying to you're increasing the volume of that drum and it's trying to suck in air. So the requirements of the standard uh, uh, require us to, to uh, normalize the pressure between the outside and the inside of that drum. Uh, if, if we didn't normalize, then typically the, the drum has a tendency to want to suck in pressure. And that, that sucking in will, will sort, sort of prevent you from seeing any leaks or any, any, any water coming under that drum. The next test that we'll, we'll review here is, uh, is the hydrostatic test. And this uh, the hydrostatic test is for liquid marked uh, containers only. Um, generally, uh, generally as, as, you, as you package liquids, uh, they, they, all, they, they all have a, a certain temperature at which they will turn to vapor. And as you convert uh, more liquids into vapor, it generates pressure. And as, as the temperature goes up, you get that, uh, you could get a, 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 a a thin barrier of, of, of vapor at the top of your drum. Well, that vapor expands as you're shipping. So you may fill at a certain temperature, it may be room temperature, but as that drum ships across the, uh, across the globe and gets onto a seagoing container and it's sitting on a seagoing container under the sun, it's heating up 20, 30, 40 degrees. And through that heat, that, 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 uh, that gas, trapped inside the top of that drum is expanding and expanding. This test is meant to sort of replicate that expansion of, of, of the vapor pressure and to see how much, how much hydraulic pressure that, 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 that container can hold with, uh, without uh, rupturing. You'll notice here in the marking that that vapor pressure or the, the test pressure is represented by the next sequence. Uh, and you'll see there 150. That 150 is the actual kilopascals used during the test. And it's always rounded down to the near to, to the nearest 10 kilopascals. For solid rated drums, there's no requirement for hydrostatic tests because there's no no uh, 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 there's no requirement for 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 the development of, of, of pressure in the drum. Uh, we have a little time lapse video here to to sort of uh, show you what a hydrostatic test looks like. You'll notice here that uh, that during the test or, or to prepare for the test that, that we actually uh, drill test ports into the top of the drum. Uh, and we do not use or do not go through the fittings of the drum because uh, as part of the test, we're actually testing those fittings as well. Uh, we generally uh, introduce pressure over a period of time. Uh, our, our, our standard here in the US is 25 kPa per minute until we reach the intended test pressure. And then we have to hold that test pressure for a certain period of time. And that period of time varies between the different substrates of materials. For steel drums, it's five minutes. For plastic drums, it's 30 minutes that we have to hold that pressure. And the primary reason between the steel and the plastic is that once steel is finished expanding, it's generally not going to expand anymore. It's very different than plastics. Plastics will continue to expand. Uh, so they leave, the, they, they leave it under pressure much longer to simulate, uh, to simulate what would go on in the real world. The next test that, we'll, that I'll show you here is a dynamic compression test. So when we do uh, testing for, for drums or for uh, compression, compression requirements, uh, there's two different methods that we can select. One is a static test, which 
which means that uh, we're going to be putting a load on top of that container. And that load is generally represented as that your, your drum at the highest density or the, the solid rated marking represented into a three meter stack or stacking your, that drum, drum over drum until you hit three meters. A static test means that we're putting that load directly on the container and we're holding it in position for, for a certain period of time. We basically have either free weights or a compression table to do this. And based upon the actual uh, uh, materials of the packing, packaging, that may be represented over a 24 hour period up to a 28 day, day period. The other method that we have to, to determine stacking strength is what's called a dynamic compression test. And a dynamic compression test basically continues to push down and push down on a drum until it, until it actually, actually fails. And then we, we, we measure the actual failure point of the drum and the maximum load that it can take before it fails. The, the calculation for a dynamic versus a static test is a 50% uh, uh, safety factor. We can stop the video now. Cheryl. The next part of the marking uh, is the year of manufacture. Uh, simply put, uh, when, when we manufacture that drum uh, and emboss that drum, uh, it must con contain that actual manufacturing year. And that it generally is the, 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 the traceability requirements for UN packaging or sort of, uh, and, and the reason for that primarily is, is the, the, the cycle and the location of the actual test, test report to confirm or validate that actual test. Uh, meaning, is this package certifiable within that year timeframe? The next part of the code designates the manufacturer, the manufacturer's symbol. Uh, for Grife, we use two different, uh, two different uh, manufacturing codes. We have GBC for anything manufactured in uh, the United States and Canada, and we have GEF for all location, uh, for locations in all other countries in the world. You may see other markings here represented, such as an M mark or a marking uh, designating a, uh, the third party laboratory. Uh, or, or, or by a regulatory body. Uh, when you see those marks, those generally represent a, an attachment to a regulatory body or, or a third party, uh, meaning that the testing was done by an outside, outside uh, 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 source. And that certification of that container was certified outside of Greif. To recap everything, uh, Throughout the world, I mean, the, the really nice thing about this marking is, is, is that you can go anywhere in the world and be able to look at one of these marks and, and fully understand, regardless of whether it was manufactured in Argentina or China or France or Belgium or the United States, all these codes mean the same thing and they all represent the same things. Um, it, there's, a, there's a general mis misconception as far as uh, the test report uh, and the certification. Uh, the most important thing to understand in all of this is that that mark that's on that container is the certificate of the container, and it's an important and it's an important part of the chain of custody. It's sort of it's the proof that the shipper and the receiver, uh, the people that are handling that packaging, it's the proof that they need to basically say that this drum is capable of holding the hazardous materials that I'm putting in that product. There's no requirement for any documentation. There's no requirement for a test report. Once that drum is marked, it is a legally binding mark. Uh, and it's, it's similar to UL stamp that goes on any sort of package or packaging uh, package product as far as safety is concerned. I, I'll turn it over to John now to cover IBC's, uh, uh, the IBC marking. Uh, because it is a, a, a different type of container, it's a little different than a non-bulk container, which we just described. John? Thanks, Phil. So jumping right in here, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the UN markings, at least the start of it here. Um, so Grice G-tubes are classified as 3-1-HA-1 composite IBCs. The 3-1 denotes that it is an IBC and that it's rated for solids, with the H and A identifying the construction details of the plastic bottle inside a steel outer cage. The one on the end signifies that this is a closed head design rather than a removable one, 
similar to the distinction between tight head and open top drums that we discussed earlier. So this 31AJ1 design type mark will appear in a couple places on the IBC. The regulations require that the UN marking be applied in a durable manner. So for D-cubes, this is achieved with a sticker attached to the front label plate with the 31AJ1 being the first bit of information in the UN string. <clears throat> We're also required to emboss the design type mark on the inner receptacle. So you also find the 31AJ1 mark on all bottles produced in our facilities. <clears throat> so now that we talked a little bit about the design mark, I'll take a minute to walk through the testing requirements. Our D-Cube designs are required to undergo six tests as part of design type qualification and annual recertification. Two units are required for testing, with the first undergoing vibration, bottom lift, stack, leak proofness, and hydrostatic testing. These tests are done in sequence, and if there's any failure in any of the tests, the entire sequence must be repeated. Separately, a second unit is subjected to a cold drop test, which dropped at a five degree angle on the pallet edge where the valve is located. I won't go too much into the specifics of each test, since they're very similar to those already discussed for non-bulk packaging. But if you'd like more information, please feel to drop a question in the chat or reach out after the webinar. So here we have the UN mark for IBCs. Um, it's, it's a little bit more extensive than what's, what's seen on the drums. Uh, the mark's really detailed. I won't go into every piece of information, especially the ones related to dates. Um, but I do want to point out a few areas that highlight some useful attributes of the package. First off, all of Grice G-Cubes are Y-rated meaning that they're approved for packaging group two and three liquids. This is important when evaluating whether a liquid can safely and legally be transported in a GQ. If you look at the first field following that GBC manufacturer symbol, the stacking test load applied is shown. This serves as a guide for identifying how much weight can safely be stacked on a full unit in a warehouse setting. After that, you have values for permissible gross mass and rated capacity. These denote both the maximum amount of weight that the IBC is rated for, along with the volume that it can safely hold. After these fields, there's always a tear weight and a value for hydrostatic test pressure associated with the design, similar to liquid rated drums. I know the mark for IBCs is a little bit more complicated than that of the drums we discussed earlier. So again, feel free to reach out afterwards if you have any additional questions or need more in-depth information. So beyond the UN string I just talked about, there's some additional marking requirements uh, that I'd like to touch on. As we mentioned a few slides ago, the 31HA1 design type must be embossed on the bottle, shown here in the picture near the top opening. But you'll also find some other information in that area. Most notably, you'll find our manufacturer symbol, along with the date wheel, showing when the bottle was produced. Finally, there's an embossment for the country authorizing the mark as well as the mold used to manufacture the bottle. Uh, in this case, our Alsip Illinois mold. So getting into the final marking requirement for IBCs, uh, let's walk through what is known as the secondary stacking mark. Uh, so you'll see this marking applied as a separate sticker on all of our G-Cube units. The value, is shown, the value shown on the sticker is meant to indicate maximum top load permitted during transport. This number is different from the stacking test load applied during the testing of the design that I mentioned in the UN string, as that's more applicable to static warehouse type conditions. Uh, and you also notice that the, the maximum top load permitted during transport shown on this sticker is much lower than the stack value in the UN mark. Um, the simple reason for this is <clears throat> the package is subjected to a great deal more stress during travel compared to stationary conditions uh, and it requires a different marked value. Shippers should always refer to this mark when determining whether it's possible to stack an IBC during transport and how much weight can be safely stacked on it. Thank you, John, and thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, you guys all have a wealth of knowledge and information between you, and I know we have a few other representatives within Grife, so we're very fortunate to have them on our, on our team. Um, please feel free to um, type into the chat function, any questions that you might have, and we'll go through a quick Q&A here now. Um, so it looks like, well, one of the first questions was, is the slide pack available? Yes, we, the, the slide deck will be available through your account manager, so please reach out to them afterwards for the slide deck. 
And then it says, is the UN marking always embossed? Um, this was popped up during the steel um, part, part there, Phil. So I'm not sure if you wanted to yeah, um, absolutely. answer that. Yeah, for, for, for steel drums only, uh, there's a requirement uh, to permanently emboss the bottom. Now that's only a requirement if the container is over a 100 liters. Anything under 100 liters doesn't need to be permanently embossed on the bottom. The, 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 I guess the tack on requirement for that is the packaging that's intended for reconditioning. Uh, and that would be the, the markings for the thicknesses of the steel. Uh, reconditioners are only allowed to recondition drums above a certain thickness. Uh, so it's important that they understand if this is something that they can uh, deal in. Great, thank you. And it looks like we have a similar question for both drums and IBCs with regards to lubricant packaging. Um, I guess there's a new rule. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. Um, the stamp on bottom of drums are required. Uh, anybody who can comment on that? John's the chemist, so. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I hate to generalize just based on knowing that it's a, a lubricant. Um, so if, if there's a, a particular requirement or question, um, I'd have to review an FDS or UN classification at minimum to, to understand what specifically uh, you're referring to with the requirements. So we'll reach out to you if you wanna um, you know, submit some more information. We'll have John review that after the webinar then. Um, so it looks like how is leak proofness tested and is it, is it tested over and guaranteed for a certain amount of time? So is it over tested, I guess, and guaranteed? So I guess I'll, uh, there, there's, there's two forms of leak proofness tests. There's obviously the qualification tests that, that, that take place. And those, those are generally done uh, with air uh, and they're done th uh, not through the fitting. So we, use, we utilize special test ports or they get drilled into the drum because uh, during that test, we're actually testing the closures at the same time, which might be a little different than some of the production related tests. Uh, if it's a production related test, it's not, it's not a requirement to test with closures in place, meaning you're just testing the container or the, the, the various junctures of the container that, that, that would provide the integrity like the chimes or the weld seam. Um, the various methods for testing uh, in the facilities range from uh, a, a pressure differential type test, meaning we're, we're, we're pressurizing and we're looking for drops in pressure. Uh, through to a, 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 a soap over seam test or what they call a, a T test. Um, there are some tack on requirements when you are doing those types of tests. And then the last one, uh, the last one generally used is what we call helium testing. And helium testing is uh, used primarily in, in, in high speed environments or, or, or manufacturing processes that, that, that are, are very consistent and, and you know, there's not a lot of change in, in, in the type of packaging that you're producing. The most, uh, probably the, the, the one that gives you the highest degree of, of, uh, of accuracy as far as leak proofness is the helium test. Uh, we're testing with a molecule that's much smaller than air and we're, uh, uh, we're, we're trying to see what the elevation of helium is beyond the background helium that exists normally in the, in the drum manufacturing environment. That is typically the one that, that, that uh, uh, it provides, the, the, uh, I, I guess, the most accuracy as far as leak, uh, uh, leak proofness. Um, wh when we are testing, we're not using a, a liquid for test. And generally, you're filling with liquids. You're not filling with a gas. So with these, aren't, these aren't pressure vessels. So. So generally, if we're if we're doing a uh, whether it's an air test or a helium test, that gas or the molecules of the gas are much smaller than than any sort of liquid that you're going to put in there. So if it doesn't, if if, if we don't see uh, uh, the gas pass through the the barrier either through a soap sud solution or being detected through a mass spectrometer, uh, then we generally say it can hold the liquid. The times as far as the testing goes or how long it, it can hold a, a general product. Uh, normally, if, it, if it's holding the product, uh, you know, it, 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 gen generally you, you, you don't, you, it generally is, it, it is based upon the product type that you're actually holding in the conditions of the environment. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a lot at play when it comes to uh, the materials. Some materials will generate internal pressures, and some are uh, are more sensitive, or 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 will or or, or will find uh, leaks 
or we'll find holes a lot easier. For example, things like transmission fluids or brake fluids. Uh, they're very difficult. They're what we call hard to hold. Um, so in, in general, though, uh, the general expectation is that, that they withstand the, the, the transport cycle, right? Uh, that's that's what the, that's what the, uh, the 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 code represents. The code doesn't ever really expire, uh, for that matter. Uh, once the code is on there, it's not as if it, it, that certificate is going to expire in a year. Uh, but a drum can only be used once in that cycle. You can't repackage it and refill it without without some some testing going on in between transport cycles. For example, if you fill the drum and ship it to someplace, if you wanted to use that drum again and ship it it would have to go through a test cycle before you shipped it again. Hey, Phil, and I, I think the other big distinction to make is there's a design type test and a design type test is a construct is a destructive test. So you're going to destroy the drum, but determine is the construction fundamentally acceptable for the, the lading. And then there's the inline production, which are completely different. And I think that the question there was, Hey, if it, if it makes the UN mark, how is it ever possible? Um, obviously, we've got quality checks and others, but there's there's just variations that can can always happen. We we try and build in process to solve that, um, but you know we also you can't think through every what's going to happen in a trailer on the way to the end end use, et cetera. So, but that was a good good detailed description, Phil. Thank you. Yeah, and I think you actually partially covered one of the other questions that someone asked about, you know, if we're doing a test, then why do sometimes drums leak? And I think, you know, you've described that they're affected by the various conditions and transportation and everything there. So um, and the manufacturing process, too. You know, there's there's variability in materials and processes and, and uh, uh, you know, you, you we, we have many controls in place um, and uh, sometimes those controls get out of uh, whack so that's where quality assurance comes in um, and the administering of those control programs to ensure that uh, you know we reduce the risk of the variability there's a question on the embossment it says in the case of open head drums with dual liquid and solid rating un approval um, how do i guess how does that i'm not it's just which embossment is that the case on open head drums I'm not sure. Yeah, so so the, the, the regulations vary uh, between what's allowable in the U.S. and what's allowable globally. Um, some some countries uh, say that you can use a liquid rated uh, packaging for a solid container, but that's not globally recognized. Uh, for example, in the ADR, it's not you, you cannot do that. Um, how, so that brings about you know dual rated or dual marked packaging, a packaging that's marked for a liquid and is also marked for a solid. In those cases, it goes through two test projects, meaning we're testing it with the liquid, the liquid regiment, and we're testing it also with the solid regiment. So there are two separate tests. And you can space. and can you mark both of those on there? Then can you have a dual rating on you, one? You can have a dual rating as long as it was as long as that package was, was tested for both solids and liquids. You can mark them both on there. Okay. Not not a whole lot different than when we have a tight head drum uh, that will dual mark for both vented and non vented fittings. Yes. We we would dual dual mark it for the liquid rating. Uh, you know, in, in the case here in North America, we've got a, a 35 gallon and both in a, a 30 gallon, both dual mark for solid and liquids that are open head plastic drums. So we have a question about what is the link between ADR in the UN, I'm sorry, in the EU, and US. PHMSA, I guess, for example, an IBC, which is UN rated in the UA via ADR, can it be used in the United States or another country to transport dangerous goods? I don't know if Eddie or Phil, when we're going across borders, how does that apply? Now, Eddie, would you like to feel this? As I explained, uh, Phil, are you uh, giving an answer? No, no, you go ahead, Eddie. Yeah, as I explained in, in my uh, presentation, that the slide said, okay, on UN level, it's a model regulation. It's just a guideline, more or less. And that guideline needs to be transposed into the regional or national legislation. In US, that's done in DOT, that's clear. In uh, Europe, that's done uh, via ADR harmonization, or even that they can write their own legislation. And on top of that, and that's perhaps not known by a lot of people, we have also have what is called national legislation. 
ADR is regional, but national legislation, and they can go even further than ADR as such. And on top of that, if two or three countries are saying, okay, fine, this is something we can put also in our legislation, they're writing something that's called multilateral um, legislation as such. And so fine, if the packaging is marked with UN, it can be used worldwide and transported all over the world. If it is only allowed to be used in states that's DOT, then it should be more DOT. Or in Europe, we also have the possibility that they say, okay, fine, we have a specific um, example or a specific transport mode, then we can use it in ADR. And then the drum is not marked UN, but then it is marked as such with ADR. Anything you want to add there, Phil, or are we good? No, I, I, I think Eddie explained it quite well there. I mean, cu countries that, that, that abide by the, the UN recommendations all have reciprocity agreements in place, and they all, they all agree to, 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 to abide by their, those standards that they put into place. I mean, anytime there's a rule change um, to, or to the UN recommendations, and Eddie described the process, these, these countries go through a harmonization process where they harmonize their regulations to whatever's changed in the UN. And it's constantly changing and, and countries are constantly harmonizing to, to what's in the UN or what's been adopted in the UN. Great. One question regarding the jump, the drum time. Um, do we test that to prevent any leak issues? Is there any, so any we're talk, when we're talking about leak proofness tests, it, 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 it's actually a requirement when you're not doing a, a helium test uh, uh, and you're doing a soap over seam test that you maintain what are called chime cuts. A chime cut is, is actually a destructive test where you're taking uh, pie, pie slices of the chime and you're visually inspecting that the formation of that chime to ensure it's, it's properly formed. The material is in the right place, the seam compounds where it should be, uh, and the, the general tightness of the chime. So yes, uh, uh, those, those have to be maintained for a, for a particular period of time. Uh, and then that sort of validates your, your uh, leak proofness test because in a, in a uh, leak proofness or soap over seams when you're doing a T, you're generally just testing the, the seven or eight inches of that chime on either side of that weld seam. So yes, there, there, there is chimes. Even I would say it's, it's almost good practice and it's, it's generally grace practice that we chime cut regardless of whether we're doing leak test or helium testing. It's our confirmation that, that we know that the, that the, that the, uh, that the seam the, the seam on that drum is uh, configured right and will generally pass the, uh, the leak proofness test before we, we apply more materials into the drum and get it to the end of the line where we're doing the healing test. We don't we don't we certainly don't want to add more materials into into a product and find out it leaks at the at the end of the process. So we we confirm we confirm and validate that seam profile for uh, in any plant, uh, regardless of helium testing or T-testing. Great, thank you. We have a couple other questions that I'm not sure are 100% applicable to this with regards to maybe some products that are gonna, go, are gonna go inside the drum. So I think we should probably take those offline. And then there's a final IBC question. It says, you showed an example of an IBC with a dynamic stacking range of 1,928 kilograms. Is that applicable for all G cubes produced? So that's that's not a dynamic stacking range. That's that's guidance on the maximum amount of, of weight that can go on the unit during transport. Um, so that, that figure 1928 is applicable um, for all 330 gallon units um, that we sell. Um, it will be a slightly smaller number for 275 gallons. Great. Thanks for that clarification, John. Awesome. I think we're um, closing as we're kind of wrapping up. Um, the questions are starting to trickle in. So again, I want to thank my panelists. Thank you all for your attendance. And I would also like to put up a, one last poll. There's been a lot of technical topics covered today. So would you like a great representative to contact you after this event? Or um, please let us know in the, in the polling vote real quickly there. And we'll definitely make sure that we follow up with you. So again, we want to thank you for making this year a great success with the webinar series. Uh, we invite you to follow us on LinkedIn and stay up to date on all things Discovered Gripe webinar events and engage with us and everything important to industrial packaging. And I want to be the first, hopefully, maybe to, to wish you happy holidays and a happy new year. Um, we'll, we'll come back with these events next year. So enjoy the holiday season. We hope that you all stay healthy. And thank you again for attending today. <laughs>